title of our sermon tonight is A Lion from Judah. A Lion from Judah, Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. And it's our joy this evening to come back to the inspired, infallible, uh, inerrant Word of God and continue our study through the book of Judges. And we're in chapter 3, we're in verses 7 through 11, where our author, likely the prophet Samuel, uh, looks back over a period of the Judges that precedes the monarchy in Israel. And he records the scripture in Scripture the history of Israel's first warrior, warlord, judge, Othniel. Now, this was a period of time in Israel's history after the conquest of Canaan under Joshua and before the time of the monarchy that began under Israel's first king, Saul. Now, that period, the period of the judges, was a time when there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It was a time of chaos. Uh, the introduction now has been set. Introduction has been completed in chapters 1 and chapters 2. The table's been set, so to speak. And chapter 1 dealt with the historical record of the conquest and depicts alongside the conquest of the land what we have called an ever-increasing conquest of compromise. We see how the Israelites compromise with the word and commands of God. Now, chapter 2 then explores the, the theological underbelly of that compromise. The children of Israel neglect to obey the word of God. Uh, to drive out the inhabitants of the land, and after that inheritance generation then dies, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the works that He had done for Israel. And what we've come to see now in the opening chapters of this book of Judges is the canonization of Israel. And we've compared, haven't we, how the canonization of Israel is a picture of the worldly influences that impress themselves upon the church today and encroach upon God's people even today. And we need to take lesson, take example here from the children of Israel in this period of the judges to cut off worldly influences and avoid the canonization of the modern day church. Uh, it's then now, after this introduction has been completed in chapters 1 and 2, it's then that we see a tragic summary of the book of Judges in chapter 2, verse 11, this text serves as a prologue or as a preamble to the cycle of the judges that now follows. So in chapter 2, verse 11, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served the Baal and the Asherahs. Now, having failed to obey God's word, the inhabitants of the land then become an idolatrous snare to Israel, and the covenant people of God become idolaters themselves, spiritual adulterers, spiritual adulteresses. Uh, they commit spiritual harlotry. In verse 14, then, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and so he, God, delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them, and he, that's God, sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of Almighty God was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, in the midst of this misery, in the midst of judgment for their sin, verse 16 the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. This is a stiff-necked and stubborn people. Not unlike us uh, when we were unconverted, stiff-necked and stubborn, unlike, not unlike Many of us can still be, even now, converted, sometimes stiff-necked. Uh, we need to take a lesson here from the children of Israel and not harden our hearts. When the Lord raised up judges for them, in verse 18, the Lord was with the judge, delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. It came to pass. Notice in verse 18 that their crying, their groaning, was because of their oppressors. Because of those who harassed them, uh, it wasn't because of their sin, but it was because of their judgment. Verse 19, then it came to pass that when the judge was dead, that they reverted, behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. 
And they did not cease from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. That's in this summary that we see the memorable pattern that marks the period of the judges, the pattern that we've talked about before. Rebellion, retribution, repentance. We have to put repentance in quotation marks because it's not genuine repentance. Maybe we could replace the word repentance with the word response. Uh, But it's not genuine repentance. It's a cry for help in pain. They're in misery. But we have rebellion, retribution, response, rescue, And then we see in this segment of text, rest during the life of the judge. The Lord gives them rest. And then relapse, rebellion, retribution, response, rescue, rest, and relapse. And the Lord tells us why Israel is subjected to this tragic pattern. One, Israel's rebellion, the canonization of the nation, the canonization of God's people. They disobey. They fail to drive out the idolatrous pagan influences as the Lord had commanded them. And so God delivers the Israelite. God sells them into the hand of their enemies in judgment. And their rebellion leads to an outpouring of God's retributive justice. And then secondly, they're subjected to this pattern because God intends to test them. Not that God should find out what was in their heart or if they would obey him, but so that they could learn to depend upon him in faith. Through the pattern of sin and rebellion... The glory of God will be on display. And through the pattern of sin and rebellion, they would learn to depend upon God and submit to Him. We are hopeless apart from God who is our deliverer. And we must continuously look to Him in faith. And it's this record of the nation of Israel from the period of the judges that should teach us to do that. Okay, So now our our record of the first judge then begins in chapter 3, verse 7. And notice with me, that the record begins with Israel's rebellion. Israel's rebellion. Look at verse 7. And so the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and Asherahs. Now we'll see this statement. The the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God. We'll see this statement at the beginning of 6 narrative records in the book. As we look at various judges throughout the period of the judges, we're going to see that statement, that formula, if you will, that theme, beginning six of those narrative records. It's as if our author wants to remind us at the outset of every single account that this is what Moses warned the people about under the law. Moses warned the people. For example, listen to what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 29. Moses says, I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt. You will turn aside from the way in which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Moses, Joshua, warned the people that this would happen. They need to remember those warnings, right? Take heed to the warnings given us in Scripture. The word forget in verse 7, far from passive. Most of the time when we think of the word forget, when we, when we forget something, it's very passive. And the older I get, it seems like the more passive I get and the more stuff I forget. But forget here in verse 7 is not passive. Forget here is willful. They suppress the truth of God in their unrighteousness. That's what they do. Doing evil, they suppress the truth, because what may be known of God was made manifest to them. It was clear to them, even his eternal power in Godhead, and yet they suppress that truth of God in their unrighteousness. Instead of acknowledging him in all their ways that he might direct their paths, they disregard him. That's what the word means. They ignore him. Um, they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image made like corruptible man, and, verse 7, they served the Baals and the Asherahs. Uh, They've got themselves in a world of trouble. They've become idolaters. The King James Version refers to Balaam and the groves, if you see that word there. Not the Asherahs, but the groves. The The Asherah was a cult goddess, a fertility goddess, a consort of Baal, and she was supposed to have birthed 70 pagan gods, okay? But the Asherah, to symbolize the Asherah, they used cultic poles or cultic trees. Um, And the the trees here, many of them, gives us the reference to the groves. This was a grove of cultic 
trees or cultic poles. Later understood, she was a fertility goddess associated with Baal. But this absurdity, the groves, these cultic trees, cultic poles, this absurdity is what Israel exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for. This is what idolatrous men give themselves over to when they forget the Lord their God. Now, we can look back at that, that account, right, and think how absurd they would erect poles, erect trees, that they would exchange the glory of God for uh, the incorruptible glory of God, for images made like corruptible man, serve these idols. But listen, people in our day and age do it all the time, don't we? Exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for a corruptible temporary pleasure in our day right? Exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for living life for ourselves in our own current day. We can't make the same idolatrous errors, the same idolatrous sins and mistakes that they did. We need to think we have the Word of God. We have the Spirit of God if you're in Christ. Worship Him. Don't turn to the idols of this world. Don't turn to the idols of leisure or pleasure or entertainment. They are just as foolish as these Asherah poles in Canaan. Do you see? Just idols of this world. Idols come many different shapes, forms, fashions. Uh, Luther said that our hearts are idol factories. We just produce idols from the heart. We must not be idolaters. Be careful, brothers and sisters. Listen, be careful. Take a look at your life. Take a look at what's important to you, what you spend your money on, what you spend your time doing, and turn away from idolatry. This is absurd. The children of Israel, the covenant people of God, have forgotten the Lord their God who has delivered them. How many times? Right? How many times? They've forgotten Him. They've turned away from Him. They disregard Him. They ignore Him. And they're serving wicked pagan idols. So how does then the Lord respond to this? We see Israel's rebellion. Well, the Lord responded with righteous retribution. The second point in the pattern. We're following right along the pattern here, aren't we? The Lord responds with righteous retribution. Look at verse 8. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. You know, in reading through this text, it's like our author here, likely Samuel, just wants to drive that name home. <laughs> wants us to remember it many, many times in this text. We're mentioning here Cushan Rishathaim. With a word in verse 8 that refers to a blast of hot air out of the nostrils of God, so to speak, using an anthropomorphism, right? A uh, language that helps us to understand. With a word that refers to a blast of hot air out of his nostrils, the Lord's wrath is said to be, in verse 8, like a searing heat against Israel. A hot blast. The Lord's anger was hot. And we've discussed this before as a, a fruit, if you will, of God's jealous covenant love. If his own holiness wasn't important, there'd be no blasting heat of retributive justice. If his love for his own covenant people wasn't there. There'd be no retributive justice to bring them back from their sin. And notice now that he himself, in verse 8, sells them. The Lord surrenders them. He gives them over. That is not a result of unfortunate circumstances, right, that this happens. They get defeated. They get conquered. There's an oppressive king now that has them under his thumb, has them in his iron grip. It's not merely that things didn't work out. Or this is just how things turned out. The Lord himself, who is sovereign over all things, works all things according to the counsel of his own will, omnipotent, the Lord was against them for calamity, and he sold them into the hand of this wicked king, Cushan Rishathaim. The Lord works providentially to accomplish his will, and this is one of the ways that he does it. He does it through retributive justice. It's right it's just, it's fair, if you want to use that term. It's just. This is retributive justice. Not allowing them, think with me now, we're talking about the covenant people of Israel, the covenant people of God. Not allowing them to remain comfortable in their sin and rebellion. Not turning away from them. Listen, the, the people have sinned. 
So I'm going to write them off, and I'm going to go over to, like he said to Moses, right? I'll make of you a great nation. What does Moses do? He intercedes to the people, and God delivers his people. Same thing here. God doesn't turn away from them. He pours out his anger, his righteous wrath in retributive justice against the people because he doesn't want them remaining comfortable in their sin and rebellion, right? He gives them over to Cushan Rishathayim because he wants them to return to him. He wants them to turn in repentance and faith, trusting the, the Lord, trusting their covenant God. So the Lord in faithfulness delivers them over. In faithfulness, he sells them into the hands of those who would despoil them. It's interesting, he gives them over to Cushan Rishathayim. The name is Cushan of double wickedness. That's what his name means. Cushan of double wickedness. The king, this king, is from Mesopotamia. And the word Mesopotamia is Aram Naharayim. Aram Naharayim is translated Mesopotamia. It's interesting, uh, Mesopotamia or Aram Naharayim means double rivers. Double rivers, two rivers. So this guy from two rivers is twice wicked. Right? That's what you have here. You got a guy from double rivers who's double wicked. It sounds like a mocking dig, doesn't it? Now you can imagine, and this is, um, this is the way the children of Israel might have looked at this guy. You got this guy from Aram Naharayim. Even the names rhyme, right? Naharayim, Rishathayim. They're thinking this guy from two rivers is double evil, right? Double wicked. The evil king from double rivers was double wicked. Rishathayim from Aram Naharayim. Now, here's what we ultimately have then in verse 8. God, in steadfast covenant love for his people, not willing to allow them to continue their betrayal against him, certainly willing to inflict misery if it means bringing them back from their harlotry, God delivers them into the hand of a wicked one to bring them back to a sense of their need for the Lord. He, he wants to wake them up. Right? It's like taking them by the lapels and shaking them, saying, return to me. Return to me, right? Not willing that they should wallow in their rebellion. This is a picture, if you will, of God's grace in salvation through judgment. There's a time in your life, if you're in Christ, if you've turned from your sin to trust him alone, there was a time in your sin when you are under the sway of a double wicked one, Right? And God comes along, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, not because your repentance had raised to a level that it was satisfactory before God, and he says, okay, now you've earned it, right? Not because of any of that, not because you're more righteous than someone else. You are equally unrighteous. We are equally unrighteous apart from Christ, right? But God intervenes. He comes in, he shakes you by your lapels and says, essentially, wake up. He opens your eyes. Right? He gives you a new heart. He indwells you with his spirit. He causes you to be born again, and he saves your wretched soul. Right? That's God's intervention. This is a picture, a picture of that. God's grace in salvation through judgment. God intends to judge the world. And if you are not in Christ, you will face his retributive justice. Those who are in Christ will be saved. This is God's grace in salvation through judgment. And later... As we continue to read through the Old Testament narrative, we're introduced to the double evils of Double Rivers Mesopotamia, okay? We're introduced to Assyria, who later conquered the northern tribes, took them away into captivity, that evil empire that took the northern tribes into captivity, and the other evil of Mesopotamia is Babylon, a kingdom who later conquered Judah and carted Judah off into captivity, the double evils of Mesopotamia. The Mesopotamia is um, it's the first mention, if you will, or an opening theme to what will be a long-term problem for the nation of Israel, a long-term picture of judgment before the coming Messiah. So it's in this brief account then, five verses, that we seem to be introduced into, to, to sweeping themes that run throughout the whole of God's 
redemptive revelation. You have the covenant-breaking history of God's own people, the vile enemies that will plague the people of God throughout their history. You have the righteous judgment of God delivering his people over to an evil one, all to be held captive by him to do his will. And then you have God's gracious salvation through judgment, all introduced in five verses right here in Judges chapter 3 with Othniel, right? These themes being introduced. So, having served Baal and the Asherahs then in verse 7, the Israelites then end up serving a king of double evil from a place of double trouble in verse 8. Rebellion, retribution, and then how do the people then respond? Look at verse 9. Rebellion, retribution, response. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. After eight years of this oppression, the people cried out, Za'ak. It's like, uh, considered an onomatopoeia. It sounds like what they did, right? They cried out, za'ak. Um, brief terms, just a brief statement in verse 9, describing here a cry of pain. This is a cry of misery, a cry for help. Not a cry in misery over sin. Not a cry of genuine repentance. They're not humbled, not even able to lift their face like the tax collector in the temple. Uh, These people are stiff-necked, but they don't like pain. They don't like suffering. They cry out to the Lord for help. They grew weary under their bondage, and so they cry out to God for mercy. And the Lord, what does the Lord do? The Lord, in great pity, in great mercy, hears their cry, and bearing witness to a steadfast faithfulness, he provides for their rescue. Retribu rebellion, retribution, response, and rescue. That's the covenant faithfulness of God, isn't it? That even... In our sin, God remains steadfast and faithful to his word. He will always remain faithful to his word. The Lord in great pity and great mercy. We serve a God who is rich in mercy, abounds in grace. Amen? And sometimes, you know, if, um, if you're like me in our you know, Christian experience or in the course of our Christian lives at, at some points in time, when we're battle, battling our sin, we're in battle over sin, and we begin to think of God as somehow withholding grace or as a God who withholds mercy, a God who oppresses rather than delivers. And we, even in our own thinking, because of our own sin, not understanding the God of the Bible, we in our own thinking begin to erect an idolatrous view of God in our own minds as a God who withholds good things from us as a God who oppresses, or a God who's always pouring out judgment and not merciful and not gracious. But listen, God is infinitely merciful. God is infinitely gracious. And if you will turn from your sin, if you will humble yourself, if you will look to him for grace, he is abounding in it. If you will cry to him for mercy, he is overflowing with mercy, right? We serve a merciful God, a loving God, infinite mercy, abounding in grace. And it's just a picture here when you've got these stiff-necked Israelites who are steeped in idolatry, and yet the Lord raises up a judge, right? Nevertheless, God raises up a judge for their rescue. It's amazing. Right? It's an amazing witness to his steadfast faithfulness and love. Not because they earned it, not because they deserved it, but simply because of the mercy of our God. So in verse 9, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. I want us to remember, right? I want us to remember when we're coming to a sense of our own sin before God. When you're embattled over sin, when you're striving against sin, remember that God has raised up a Savior, raised up a Deliverer, Jesus Christ the righteous. And when we sin, we can confess our sins to Him, and He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our iniquity. All our iniquity. That's what God does in Jesus Christ. He pours out mercy so don't refrain from going to him in mercy. Like a, like a child in need, go to him for mercy. Go to him for grace. God raises up deliverers. God raises here a savior. He is a merciful, merciful God. 
Here in verse 9, we're introduced to God's deliverer. It's Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The same God now who delivered them into bondage due to their sin, who turned them over to judgment, now is the same God who raises up a deliverer to save them out of that bondage. The word for deliverer here is Moshia. It means uh, Messiah, it means Savior. Right? God raises up for them a Savior. And that Savior is Othniel, who is the nephew of Caleb, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. The name Othniel means Lion of God. That's what the name means, Lion of God. And Othniel was a lion of a man. If you remember, Othniel, from previous chapter, Othniel was the hero of Debir, right, who conquered the city. Conquering the city, he won Aksa, Caleb's daughter, as his wife. And Othniel, like Caleb... The lion was from the tribe of Judah. We have here a lion from the tribe of Judah, right? A lion from the tribe of Judah sent by God to save his people by destroying the evil one who held them captive because of their sin, right? What's the Lord trying to tell us here? <laughs> What's the Lord picturing for us? This is not a coincidence. <laughs> no such thing in the Bible. This lion from the tribe of Judah came in the power of the Spirit of God. Look at verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Shaphat. He judged Israel. He was the anointed, anointed by the Spirit. He was the anointed warlord, warrior, governor of God. Anointed with the Spirit of God. And what did he do? What did this Messiah, what did this Savior do? He went out to war. Right? Verse 10, he went out to war. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. There's um, eschatological end times overtones all over this, isn't there? Right? The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he comes back to wage and to make war. He will conquer his enemies. He will throw down the wicked, pagan, idolatrous kingdoms of this world. And he will conquer and reign, right? This one goes out to war, war and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. That double wicked man from double rivers is conquered. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathayim. The people, powerless to save themselves from the, the grip of this evil one, there was nothing that they could do but to cry aloud to God in their misery. And then God raises up one man from among them. Raises up a man from among them. He empowers him by the Spirit of God to come and to conquer. And this lion of Judah bound the strong man, plundered his house, set at liberty the captives, and gave his people rest. It's what Othniel does for the people of Israel in conquering Cushan Rishathaim. So, verse 11 what was the result then? The land had rest for 40 years, and then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. All this foreshadowing, isn't it? And there are those who would say that types or typology doesn't exist in the Bible. That um, the only way that you would be able to see types and shadows and their fulfillments or their substance is that the Bible specifically says it's a type. Right? So like the ark through the water is a type of baptism. Peter says so. But listen, types, shadows, substance, reality is pictured all over the biblical text. Right? It's everywhere in the biblical text. These things are analogous to, they're illustrative of realities that are heavenly realities that the people of God should take great encouragement from. Right? To see this story take place should encourage us to look forward to our own conquering warlord, warrior, judge who is coming to deliver his people and to enter into the kingdom with us. Right? This should cause us great encouragement to look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a shadow. Jesus Christ is the substance. Right? This is a foreshadowing. Jesus Christ is the coming reality. This eschatological warrior savior king is also a lion from the tribe of Judah, but a far greater lion, and he is coming back. 
This is a shadow of future su- substance. It's pointing us forward. And we're reminded of the, the men who walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, right? He, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounds for us in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This text concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. You see? So how does then this judge, this Moshiach, how does he accomplish such a miraculous deliverance? Well, he does so in the power of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit. We talked very briefly last week about the inseparable operations of the Trinity. right? In our redemption, in redemptive work, in creation we saw it, also in the redemptive work of God for his people, all three members of the Godhead are in perfect harmony, in perfect economy of work, labor, in perfect work, in perfect harmony to redeem his people. They all play, each person of the Godhead, playing a role in our redemption. We see that even here. God sends the deliverer. The deliverer comes in the power of the Spirit of God, in awesome power, and delivers his people. There's a common misconception, though, about how the Spirit of God operates in the Old Testament. Very common misconception. In the Old Testament, people would say, people will say that the Spirit of God comes upon God's people because, as we see here, the Spirit of God came upon Othniel, okay? And people would say, well, in the New Testament, the Spirit of God indwells his people. So it looks like there's discontinuity. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God comes upon his people. In the New Testament, the Spirit of God indwells his people. That's a misunderstanding of the Spirit's work. That's not how it works, okay? That's a misunderstanding of pneumatology, the Spirit's work. There's a continuity between the Testaments, and here's basically what it is. When someone is saved in the New Testament, they are saved by virtue of the New Covenant, secured by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when they're saved by virtue of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ under the new covenant, they receive all the blessings, all the promises of the new covenant, right? Where God says, I will take your heart of stone out of your chest, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to obey me, right? The Lord says that as a covenant promise of the new covenant. God says, I will put my spirit within you and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and judgments. All right? Well, when someone is saved in the Old Testament, how are they saved? Are they saved any differently in the Old Testament than we are in the New Testament? No, they're not. There's continuity between the Testaments. They're saved in the very same way. When someone is saved in the Old Testament, they are saved by virtue of faith in the Lord's promised Messiah They're saved by virtue of the new covenant, secured by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they, as we do, receive all the blessings and promises of the new covenant. In other words, God indwells all believers. They receive the promises as we do. That means God gives them a new heart. God indwells them with his spirit, and God causes them to walk according to his statutes. That begins with all believers at regeneration. Everyone who comes to faith in Christ comes to faith as a fruit of God's regenerating work in the heart of that sinner. They are born again, and the Lord grants them repentance and faith. That begins at regeneration, and the Spirit empowers them then to live for the Lord and persevere in the faith. The Spirit applies all the blessings of redemption. So what then explains the work of the Spirit that we see, for example, in the book of Acts and the coming of the Spirit upon believers in the New Testament that we see outlined particularly in the book of Acts? There's another contextual reason why the Spirit is seen, evidenced, observed as coming in the book of Acts. I want us to understand that. Notice with me when the Spirit comes upon believers in the book of Acts. The Spirit comes in power at Pentecost To who in chapter 2 of Acts? To Jewish believers. Okay, now think with me. The Spirit comes in power at Pentecost to Jewish believers in Acts chapter 2. He is shown to come to Samaritan believers in Acts chapter 7. He is shown to come to Gentile believers in Judea in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and Cornelius' household, right? And he is shown to come to Gentile believers outside Judea 
in Acts chapter 19. So what's happening as he comes to Jews in Jerusalem, Gentile believers in Judea, or Samaritans, then Gentile believers in Judea, then Gentile believers outside of Judea, what is the Lord doing? What is the Lord showing us? He's showing us that in the new covenant, in the new covenant, one secured by the shed blood, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that every tribe, tongue, and nation is together in that covenant, all having the Spirit. That way, the coming of the Spirit, there's no Samaritan church, and there's no Gentile God-fearing church, and there's no Jewish church. We all have the Spirit. Everyone in that covenant has the Spirit of God in them, indwelling them. You see, so the Spirit's not coming in a new way per se. Everyone who's saved in the Old Testament has the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, He's coming for a specific reason, shown to be coming in Acts, for allowing us to see, for the unity of the church, to see the expanding boundaries associated with the new covenant, okay? That's the reason we see the Spirit given in that way in the book of Acts. In each case, the giving of the Spirit in New Testament context shows the boundary of the new covenant church and the gift of the Spirit to all believers. Here, in texts like this one, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon a person, or when the Bible says that the the hand of the Lord was with him, it's another way of saying that, It's referring to, as one commentator put it, the arresting presence and power of God. The Spirit of God comes upon Othniel as judge, and he arrests him in power and works through Othniel to accomplish his will. The empowering presence of the Spirit of God transforms this simple man from Judah into the mighty Shaphat of God, the conqueror of kings. Not unlike the miracle that takes place in the heart of a sinner when the Spirit of God comes in regeneration, right? Think about it with me. The the Spirit of God coming upon Othniel, the Spirit of God coming upon Samson, as we'll see, right? The Spirit of God coming upon the mighty men of David and their conquests, or the Spirit of God coming upon or indwelling that wretched sinner and miraculously changing them from the inside out from a God hater to one who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, right? From one who is persisting in their sin to one now who hates their sin and turns from it to faith in him, right? That's a miracle of the powerful working of the Spirit of God in the life of believers. In preaching to Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10, Peter described Jesus as anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. Jesus who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus Christ we know to be God in the flesh. But he came and he worked in the power of the Spirit of God. And God was with him. God exercises his will through his Spirit. Right? Jesus Christ went out in the power of the Spirit. Here, Othniel, the Spirit of God comes upon him, the inseparable operations of the Trinity. As long as Othniel lived, the land had rest, verse 11. That's a foreshadowing of our final rest that is yet to come. As long as Othniel lived, the land had rest. How long will our conquering Savior live? (laughs) <laughs> he ever lives. He ever lives. So how long will our rest be? Forever and forever and forever and forever. <laughs> Amen. In their difficulty, they were made to remember the Lord. Their hearts were turned back to Him, and the Lord provided rest. Well, what happened then when the judge died? Verse 12, and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of of the Lord. Don't we need a full and final deliverance, a once for all work of our Savior to deliver us from sin and death? What they needed was a judge who would conquer death. Wouldn't die, but they needed a judge who would conquer death and win not a temporary peace, a temporary rest, but an everlasting peace, an everlasting rest. We were born in a far more debilitating, 
and destructive bondage. Our bondage far more destructive than theirs. We were subject to a far more wicked, far more destructive enemy. Not just double wicked, the most wicked. Our own sin, double evil in the sight of God. But by God's grace, by God's mercy, we've been provided with far better promises. We have a far better covenant, all won by a far better and ever-living, conquering warlord king who has defeated sin and death, has defeated the wicked one, and has set us free from bondage to our sin. What should be our response? Will you be like the Israelites and just turn back and revert to the wickedness that you once participated in before he delivered you? Really? (laughs) Is that what we'll do? Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Will we like a dog returning to his vomit, go back to our sin, like a pig wallowing in the mire? Will we go back? God has anointed a conquering warlord king who has come and will come with the Spirit of God upon him. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he's ordained. And he's given assurance of this to all, by raising him from the dead. Will he be your deliverer or will he be your retributive justice? Will he be your savior or will he be your executioner? Now, now is the time for mercy. Now is the time for grace. If you have never cried aloud for deliverance, do so now. Do you not know Do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you and thank you that you in unspeakable grace in unfathomable mercy with infinite love have made provision for our sin, made provision for our redemption in the person and in the work and the sacrifice of your only begotten Son. We praise you, God, that you sent him into the world to save sinners And Lord, we are sinners. We need salvation. We need redemption. Thank you, God, that um, that's simply not anything that we can even attempt to earn on our own, according to our own works or, or by our own will. But praise be to you that it is entirely finished, entirely accomplished by him, by his work, by his perfect life and his perfect sacrifice and thank you lord that that is ours by faith Uh, this is wondrous in our eyes our conquering king we praise you and we worship you and look forward lord to his soon return i pray if anyone is here that has not turned to trust him alone for salvation they would do that now tonight even lord even sitting sitting here this evening They would give up their rebellion against him. They would give up living life for themselves and would turn by faith to him who is able to deliver them uh, from out, out from bondage to the wicked one, out from bondage to their own sin, and can set them in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We praise you and thank you for this blessed grace and pray, Lord, that you would be glorified and worshiped and magnified for it for all eternity. We love you and we thank you for this time together to consider these things from your word. Help us, Lord, to apply them. Help us to meditate on them, to think according to them, to live according to them. For your glory, for our good, in Jesus' name, amen.